Hello and welcome to The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield. I'm your host, and this is a podcast about our deepest values, the different things we believe, and how those with some kind of public voice have learned to navigate difference. In this episode, I spoke to Professor Chris French. Chris is head of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit in the Psychology Department at Goldsmiths University of London, a fellow of the British Psychological Society, and a patron of Humanists UK. Anomalistic psychology, just in case, like me, you didn't know, is the study of anomalous experiences, commonly known as the paranormal or the supernatural. We spoke about what being a skeptic means to him, the difficulty of living out a fully materialist worldview, why even scientists have to take some things on faith, and much more. I really hope you enjoy listening. Chris, I'm going to ask you what you hold sacred, which you have had some warning about, but I know that particularly for academics, this, it, actually any kind of deep personal reflection, but particularly ones with hefty words that you maybe want to interrogate or define can be quite difficult to do. So let's warm up a little bit with you just saying, how was this experience of reflecting what you hold sacred? Do you react against it? Does it feel comfortable? Do you have no idea? What was the process like? I think it was, it was quite interesting. Um, I mean, as you say, as an academic, and particularly as somebody who likes to think of themselves as a scientist, um, you don't, you're not encouraged, certainly traditionally, to kind of uh, to even talk in the first person, you know. Um, now, recently, I have actually been kind of putting a bit more of myself into things that I write. Um, I mean, I'm writing a kind of popular science book at the moment. The first chapter is kind of pretty much autobiographical. So, but even then, uh, I kind of found it quite uncomfortable at first to do that. Um, and so that was kind of, you know, that, that's kind of part of the issue. I think the other part of the issue is that, of course, um, I'm, a, I'm a kind of humanist. I'm a skeptic. I'm an atheist. And so that very word sacred <laughs> is... Uh, it was quite tricky for me. So I kind of, I was reflecting on it and, and kind of thinking about it. Um, and I kind of, I kind of finally decided that in terms of uh, kind of ironically, what would be one of my sacred values is probably that nothing is sacred. <laughs> in so far as everything can be questioned, you know, I, I, I don't kind of believe in any kind of uh, great authorities outside of ourselves that can, tell us the way the world is, the way the universe works, how we should and shouldn't behave. Um, and yeah, basically, you know, everything is up for questioning and we should try wherever possible to make decisions on the basis of evidence and so on and so forth. Um, and so, you know, that, that was kind of part of it in terms of the kind of values. Um, I mean, for me, I... I think tolerance is hugely important. I, I, should, I should say from the outset, I kind of don't, because of that, I don't really know why I have the values I have. I have them. I don't know why I have them. Yeah. Uh, it just feels like certain things are the right thing to do, you know, to to try and be fair, uh, to, to help people who need help, all those kind of, you know, motherhood and apple pie type values, but they just seem like the right thing to do. It's not because I'm taking any guidance from any kind of holy book or authority figure. It just feels like, well, that's really how we should live our lives. And I, and I can't really justify it any better than that. I've been reading, obviously, a little bit about you and uh, you've, you've said that elsewhere. And I found that honesty very refreshing because we do have that, I think, tendency to... Um, post hoc rationalize the thing that we emotionally or instinctively come to, you know, the, the, there's so much work in, in your field that I know very little of and have a sort of mm -hmm. ignorant, ignorant amateur perspective of, but that sense of we, we want to believe that we come to our conclusions primarily on sifting evidence and data, yeah. um, but yeah. often something deeper and not exactly irrational, but maybe pre-rational is leading us. That's a nice way of putting it, I think. Yeah, yeah. I would like to pull out that thread. I'm not supposed to do this right now. I'm supposed to go into a charter, <laughs> but I'm going to pull out the thread about that, the depersonal, maybe impersonal, it's extremes, I guess, more inhuman, um, way that science has been modelled 
um, because you, you're exactly right. And whenever I talk to academics, and particularly those in, in the social sciences generally and in the hard sciences particularly, this, there is this sense that the human being, the complexities of the human person and the self somehow are a danger to truth and the search for truth, that they might kind of pollute what we're trying to get at. And obviously that, that, that has a huge resonance and we all know ways that can be true. But one of the reasons I start with what people believe and their childhood is I feel almost that when we surface the complexity of the human, we have a fuller sense of where each other are coming from and more likely to be empathetic. Do you think it's moving in science? And what do you think is the sort of consequences of that framing and that formation that many, many, many academics and scientists have been through? I think th- I think there is a uh, a movement certainly towards um, acknowledging that. I mean, I was I can I remember kind of being in the sixth form at school and kind of talking about this sort of stuff in general studies classes, and uh, you know the idea was that kind of science was kind of value free, it was value neutral, um, that the uses that people put. To science and technology, that was another matter, but science itself was kind of value-free and, and neutral. Um, and I suppose, I mean, there is a part of me that still kind of has some sympathy with that view, but also I don't think you can get away from the, the fact that uh, you know, science is inherently value-laden, um, we, and we need to kind of accept that, take it, take it on board, and and work with that as a factor in our own thinking, um, and that I think is 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 a good thing. There's, I mean, there's no doubt at all that, particularly in psychology, probably social science more generally, um, we have a very um, particular view on things, or at least we have traditionally had a very particular view on things. It's very much from a kind of Western perspective. Um, I mean, I, I I still very much would see myself as being a kind of uh, a materialist in one sense. Um, you know, one, one of the areas of philosophy that has always fascinated me has been the whole kind of mind-body problem. And I don't think that anybody has come close to, to solving that one, any of the philosophers, any of the scientists. There's been a, you know, a lot of interesting stuff written. Um and I suppose because of that, I do, by and large, subscribe to the view that consciousness, whatever it is, all the soul, whatever you'd like, word you'd like to use, uh, is entirely dependent upon physical stuff that's happening in the brain. Now, I mean, I may be wrong about that. And, and for me, a really important part of scepticism is always to be open to the possibility you might be wrong. Subjectively, intuitively, I have a dualist view. You know, mental stuff feels different to stuff out there, to tables, chairs, even brains. You know, it's, it's a different kind of thing. Um, and I've never, I, I kind of can't resolve that one. And so I think that what we need to do, and again, particularly as scientists, is to kind of accept that at the, at the edges of knowledge, there's just stuff that we just say, well, we don't know. We just don't know. And to be, to be comfortable with saying that, I suppose another of my sacred values would be that uh, I am very, very wary and suspicious of anyone who claims certainty and certain knowledge. I think, yeah, tread very carefully where that is concerned. Yeah. Oh, lovely threads to pull on. Let's wind <laughs> back and get a sense of your story. And again, this might be uncomfortable because academics don't normally do this, but I would love to hear a bit about your childhood. Just Paint me a word picture, but particularly with reference if there were any big ideas that you think have formed you, you know, positively or negatively, religious, philosophical, political, paranormal, given your later (laughs) work, you know, what was around in the air? As a a kid, um, you know, again, you said you were going to be asking me this question, so I've been thinking about it. We, We were not the kind of family who had big discussions and debates on really any of those things. I, I was kind of, I think, fairly typical for my era, for this country. Um, my uh, parents would, certainly my mum, I'm never quite so sure about my dad, and he's not around to ask anymore, but um, my mother was kind of a fairly traditional kind of C of E, which meant that, you know, we didn't really talk much about religion. <laughs> we went to church for... Um, uh, 
weddings, funerals, maybe sometimes at Christmas, but but that was about it. My mother would still, you know, she still believed in God. We were brought up to uh, to say our prayers at night and so on. And I think, you know, for a long time, I certainly, um, you know, as a kid, I would have said I believed in God and wouldn't have even doubted it. So no reason to doubt it. I do remember kind of sixth form at school, around about age of 18, getting interested in philosophy, just reading those kind of very basic introductions to philosophy and so on. Chose philosophy as a subsid when I went to do my degree at Manchester. So I was into those kind of issues then. That's when I discovered the joys of uh, Sir Carl Raymond Popper. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I can remember, I mean, again, I, I have written about this, I've spoken about this before. I At that point, I still believed in quite a lot of paranormal stuff. I was interested in that stuff. And where did that come from? Well, again, not from my parents. No, it doesn't sound <laughs> like not it. from anybody that I particularly knew. Just a general kind of fascination with weird stuff. Um, and it wasn't a kind of overwhelming passion. I didn't go on kind of ghost hunts or anything like that. But I would read books about it. I would uh, watch programmes on TV. I was petrified of ghosts, absolutely right. terrified of ghosts. I mean, I slept with a nightlight until a lot later than most children do, you know. Um, And so I don't really know where it came from, to be perfectly honest. But I had that kind of interest in those things. Um, And really, I mean, I know you're kind of asking about childhood, but in, in terms of the kind of views that I'm now, if I'm known for anything I'm known for, it wasn't until I was doing my PhD at Leicester University when someone recommended a particular book, which I'm forever taking down off the shelf because kind of journalists and media people like to talk about the fact that you used to believe in this and then then you've turned to a a sceptic. It was a book uh, by uh, James Alcock called Parapsychology, Science or Magic. And it was the very first sceptical treatment of all that stuff that I'd ever come across. And I did enjoy the book. I did find it very... uh, convincing and it opened up for me the kind of uh, the joys of the um of, of, of the the world of skepticism that I hadn't really been aware of um up until that point most of the stuff that I'd read and seen on tv was all very uncritical assessments um and to realize that yeah. there were these other possible explanations and that there was a skeptical literature out there was quite an eye-opener for me and uh, yeah I found it all very I remember being kind of you know quite I find it very exciting, really, you know, reading all these books by, about kind of, well, the first of the psychology of weird experiences, um, the techniques used by deliberate con artists to convince other people that you have psychic abilities and so on. It was all interesting and quite fun stuff. You know, people talk about being temperamentally sceptical, but how would you, and I'm, I'm, I think there's a sort of Venn diagram here, but you're both an atheist and a humanist <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and a sceptic. And it does feel like that yeah. there's a particular posture to the world or maybe even a worldview that is scepticism yeah. In, yeah. in positive terms, because I think people mostly see it as, you know, a, um, a negating position and, and, and that's some of its strength. But what it, what is it? Help me understand. I mean, and that is one of the kind of uh, the, the problems. I mean, I, you know, I edited the Skeptic magazine, the UK version of it, for for, for a decade, and um, the endless discussions about oh, should we change the title, you know. But by that time, yeah. the kind of sceptical movement uh, had uh, had kind of established itself, and for those people who knew what it was, they didn't see it as being a negative thing. Um, really, yeah. it, it's just a matter of, as I say, kind of. I suppose it is that idea that kind of everything is up for questioning. Um, that yeah. very often people hold views that are wrong, but it's about show me the evidence. You know, a- a- any idea might be valid, no matter how crazy it might sound, but show me the evidence, convince me. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that, that I think pretty much goes to the heart of it. I mean, and, and you know, and the way, the kind of evidence that people who self-identify as sceptics would find the most convincing would be kind of good, well, you know, good quality empirical evidence. So um, yeah. a kind of recognition that uh, personal experience is not always the best guide to to what is true. And I suppose also a kind of um, a commitment to, uh, this kind of comes from more from the science aspect, that it's about trying to find out what is true rather than necessarily adopting beliefs just because they might make us feel good, you know. 
and you know, yeah. so on and so yeah. forth. Um, but I, I, I fully accept that uh, for a lot of people, you know, I mean, I mean the idea, the, the, the whole title Skeptics in the Pub has always, for me, kind of summed up this mental image of grumpy old men sitting around with pints of warm bitter all going, oh, I don't believe that, do you? You know, <laughs> uh, that's really not what it's like, you know, it's, um, it's a much more kind of fun place to be. Yeah, you're, you're really, um, as I often find when I talk to people from different sort of tribes, when someone speaks about something that they love and they feel an affinity to, it really helps feel or think yourself into that world, which is a great and useful activity, I think. Um, I'd love to say, what, and this is why I, lo- I love interviewing academics and, you know, I run a research organisation, some of my best friends are academics. Um, but yeah. I, um, you wouldn't let your daughter marry one though, would you? <laughs> um, what, what do you, so I spoke to a friend of mine ahead of this, to say I was speaking yeah. to you, who is a um, uh, academic in uh, evolutionary psychology, mm-hmm. various kinds of psychology and a priest. And he uh, thinks very deeply about these things. And he is fascinated by what researchers and social scientists do with their own beliefs and whether they're able to apply those standards of evidence in their own lives and, and the disconnect I think they can sometimes feel. And then the, the, the story that came to mind is another friend of mine who is an anthropologist of Japanese and um, Southeast Asian religion who was invited by one of his students to a baptism. They were getting baptised. They said, would you like to come to this baptism? He said, oh, yes, I'd love to. And when he got there, the student was there and she said, uh, or he, I don't know who, uh, you can come, but not if you come as an anthropologist, only if you come as a person. Nice. (laughs) And it was a really, really powerful moment for him because he realised his posture on the world was always analytical. And he didn't actually necessarily know how to experience or be in his own body or in his own feelings. Anyway, it's a longer yeah. story, but you can see what yeah, I'm yeah. asking. How do you, what's your lived experience of trying to embody some of these things and how do you navigate it? When I first got into scepticism, I would say I held some views that were kind of rather, I, I want of a better word, extreme, um, that I would now kind of, reject. So um, I, I, I kind of, for example, that anyone who claimed to have paranormal powers was a deliberate fraud. Well, I don't believe that anymore. I think most of the people who claim it, not all by any means, there are deliberate con artists out there, but most of the people who claim to have these this gift, they sincerely believe that they've got this gift. Um, that any kind of paranormal or supernatural beliefs were kind of, uh, you know, not good for you. Well, actually, again, I don't believe that. I think that um, they, they often have a, a psychological function that can help people. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and kind of various other, I mean, and, and I suppose one of the other things that having got into this area and thought about these issues for a long time, accepting that we, we are all we all have an irrational side to us, and actually, kind of quite celebrating that. I, I you know, I, I, I love, well, I love the weird stuff in the first place. So, you know, uh, celebrating that kind of irrationality. Um, you know, I mean, I, I kind of like surrealist art. You know, I mean, that's the kind of uh, that, that that is just part of us, and and we kind of shouldn't try to deny it and close it down. Um, just accept it. And I also think you've got a better chance of understanding where some of the kind of aspects of what I would think of as magical thinking come from if you recognise that you've still got that's still a part of you. And and so I suppose to kind of get to the core of your question, um, it would depend on the context that I'm in, whether I'm thinking right now I need to uh kind of try and be as rational and logical about a problem and and thinking about it as I possibly can be, um, as opposed to just kind of being a human being and just uh, enjoying life, getting on with it, recognising that, you know, the kind of cognitive biases that I think are fundamental to a lot of this stuff, yes, they're a part of everybody. Anybody who claims that they are just a kind of neutral assessor of the evidence is is deluded you know none of us are we all come to all situations in life with preconceptions cognitive biases are much easier to see in other people aren't they 
Absolutely, yeah. I guess I'm, I'm not biased. I mean, my, my wife and I were both psychologists. You know, we both are very aware of the frailty of human memory, for example, and yet we'll still have big arguments about who said what when. You know, I mean, and so there is that kind of disconnect. I can just imagine, and this maybe this is just my overthinking tendencies, but it it's. Do you ever feel like you get into eternal feedback loop of being skeptical of your skepticism and doubting your <laughs> doubts and not knowing what you can actually know about the world because because of the awareness of these biases? Is is it ever paralyzing, or do you just have to know that and with one bit of you and then crack on with the other? Well, I think no. I mean, I mean, the way I cope with it. I mean, I think maybe it's some, it may well affect some people like that. But the way I cope with it is to just say that there are certain things that I do accept just on faith. Now, by and large, being yeah. a skeptic, of course, I am not a great fan of faith. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, I like, for example, you know, I do believe there is a universe out there. You know, I mean, I can't see any kind of logical contradictions to a solipsist position. But yeah, I choose. No, I don't. I don't choose not to believe it. I don't believe it. Uh, I just don't. Yeah. Now, as I say, I couldn't defend that logically and rationally down to to the last uh, yeah, detail. Um, but okay, then I will just. I'm just gonna. I, I'm so basically again, and what I do with a lot of the kind of um, the anomalistic psychology stuff, it's a working hypothesis. So I have a working hypothesis that there is a universe out there, and we can find out stuff about it. When it comes to anomalistic yeah. psychology, my working hypothesis is to say, well, let's just assume that paranormal forces don't exist. Can we explain the weird experiences that people have in other psychological terms? And then can we put those explanations to the test, preferably? You know, um, And so it is just a kind of recognition of saying, I, you know, I feel kind of relatively sure about certain of my beliefs, all the stuff at the edges... Yeah. I'm just going to have to say, well, that's that's just what I believe. And I couldn't necessarily yeah. give you, a, you know, a definitive proof that uh, that I'm right. The thing that Wittgenstein said, isn't it? That there's a certain point you hit bedrock and you stop digging. Yeah, like this is yeah. this is as low as I can go yeah. in defining it. Which and ironically I, is is often how I feel about my belief in God. I yeah. think there are, you know, I think there are good intellectual reasons for belief in God. I don't, I don't believe it despite the evidence. I think there are. A range of different types of evidence, but ultimately, it is something beyond which I can't, I can't, I cannot prove it to you. Yeah, yeah. And having to get comfortable with that uh, is, I think, a sort of psychologically healthy landing place of, of, as you say, just this is your best guess. This is your working hypothesis of life, and you will yeah. go through it. Um, yeah, I, I don't think any of us, uh, again, as somebody who doesn't actually believe in God, I don't think any of us have a kind of um, God-like omniscience to yeah. know this is the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. all of us, to, to we might have different versions of what we find, feel comfortable with, but yeah, you, you are going to get to that point where you say, well, I just, I just think that's the way things are, you know. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about psychology more broadly in the public conversation because there's, I, you know, as again, as just an observer, observer, I'm always not surprised, I guess, resigned to the fact that in any grouping of human beings, we will find a way to create divisions. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, the, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's who I'm following at the moment on social media, which is always a terrible um, way, but you, it does give you a way of listening into conversations. And there does seem to be some, ironically, some skepticism with it from physicists and hard, hard scientists that they'd call themselves towards psychology in particular. And it's fascinating to me because obviously psychology in the public mind is having a real moment. You know, the last 10 years, all the books have been these big thinking, mm -hmm. understand yourselves, you know, where it crosses over with ev ev evolutionary psychology and behavioral economics. People love it. They're like, yeah, let's, let's get hold of these things. And I often take these studies as, you know, gospel. Yeah. <laughs> but there's been hitting replication crises with some yeah. of these studies where some of the things we thought were just like settled facts about ourselves maybe aren't settled. What's that experience been like as a psychologist? Talk to me about the divisions within academia and how do, where do you think psychology is currently sitting in terms of its public influence? Right. Well, I mean, for, first off, to say that the whole kind of replication crisis, as it's been called, I, I actually see as being a very healthy bit of self-criticism. Um, and I mean, it has been, it's, it's kind of been, it's, it's been fascinating. I ended up kind of 
giving it uh, quite a lot of thought as a consequence of, um, you probably don't remember this, but it was quite big in my world. Um, there was a paper published in a very well-respected mainstream psychology journal, which seemed to uh, provide strong evidence that precognition is real, that people can somehow sense future events. Um, and this was by uh, Professor Daryl Bem, who's very well-respected social psychologist, been around for decades. Um, unusually, for a psychologist known to be very sympathetic towards parapsychology and towards paranormal claims. Um, th this got picked up by the science media all around the world. Um, and to Bem's credit, he said he wanted people to replicate his study. So we decided, we being myself, uh, Richard Wiseman and Stuart Ritchie, that we would give it a go. Bem had said that he would make his software available to make it easier for people to run the study. So I confess, we had an ulterior motive. We thought this is going to be a pretty quick way of getting a paper into a very good journal. Uh, we didn't expect to replicate his results. I won't, I won't go into the details of what, what, what he did and what he found, um, but we didn't replicate his results anyway. We wrote up our paper, we sent it into the editor, and it was rejected without being sent out for peer review on the grounds that uh, the editor said, we don't publish replications. You know, we're wow. probably being told that replication is the cornerstone of science, but you do a straight replication, especially a failed replication. Uh, I'm not interested at all. <gasps> we said, but this is ridiculous. You know, this, this, if this is a real finding, it's incredibly important. But if it's not, that's important too, you know. Um, we tried two other high-impact journals, got exactly the same treatment. And then this became a bit of a story in itself, um, the, the fact that we couldn't even get our paper sent out for peer review. Eventually, we uh, published it in uh, an open access journal. This fed into this debate. Then the question is, well, how did this paper come to be published in this, the, the original paper in this journal? Some people took the approach that, which I don't agree with, that, well, we, we know that the, there's no such thing as precognition, therefore something's gone wrong. I didn't think that. I you know, thought, well, let's try and replicate it. I didn't think we would. We didn't. Um, but it, it highlighted something that was very wrong with the whole uh, model of science publishing. That is that you won't, there's a bias, particularly in the top journals, towards new results, so you don't know how robust and replicable they are, um, and also against just replications, uh, even though we're always told, in theory, replications are so important. Um, now, it did lead then to, a kind of, not, it, it, not on its own, this led, fed into a wider debate about the replication crisis in psychology, whereby um, lots of findings which people had accepted as being kind of real were questioned, and rep there, were, there were failures to replicate some standard effects, um, that, that led to, I suppose, two, two main things. One was the kind of uh, questioning of, well, how did these results come up in the first place? Uh, and it's, it's, I think it's still, I think, I mean, you can only go on your own impressions, quite rare for there to be out-and-out -out fraud within science, because that's just such a big no-no. Far more dangerous, I think, and far, far more pervasive is what are called questionable research practices. So these are not kind of major crimes. They're uh, just giving yourself the benefit of the doubt here and there and the cumulative effect of that. Because we're all under such pressure. Are we? I've retired now. But, you know, Academics are under such pressure to publish in high-quality journals. Your, 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 your career depends on that. Getting grants depends on that. Your reputation depends on that. Um, and particularly under the kind of way that science worked, um, it, 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 there are so many decision points about how you analyse your data, uh, how you present your results, and so on and so forth. Um, undisclosed degrees of flexibility, as it's sometimes called. Um, and so I think it's good that, there's like, that, what, that what has happened is there's been a move now towards kind of put, providing solutions to control for those things. So I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about... Mm. Forgive me, this is another very long-winded <laughs> question that I have not framed properly, but it's always a sign that I'm having an interesting conversation with someone. Uh, about how we understand what a human... What, 
what humans are like, what the human being is, about our basic anthropology, not in the sense of the science, you know, the, the discipline, but our framing of the human. And from my tradition, from Christianity, we get, you know, you have, it's twisted and misused, but we get a reasonably clear emerging sense of what the human beings is like, that we are fundamentally relational. And that comes from kind of Trinitarian theology. We're made in the image of God. God is relationship. Human beings are fundamentally relational. That kind of free, rational individuals are, that that framing is less accurate than the sense of persons, persons in relationships, being in, beings in communion. It's very sort of deep in Christian thought. And then the, obviously, and the way it's usually framed is through sin, but you've talked about fragility and fallibility. And that, I think, if Christianity does anything, it gives you a strong sense of self-skepticism. And at its worst, that, it, you know, that can be psychologically very harmful if sin is taught in a way that is oppressive. But at its healthiest form, can give you a sense of humility and other people's fallibility and other people's fragility. And there's various other kind of threads of it. But as I've been seeing, you know, psychology's prominence in the public conversation about the human being, I've been thinking there's a lot of overlap here. There's a huge amount of um, wisdom in both these traditions to help us understand ourselves. It'd be interesting to see if, if you see those as kind of complementary or pulling in different directions. In fact, I'm going to stop that because I keep asking double questions and just, just to put that to you and say, what are your thoughts? Well, I think, again, um, I think it gets back to that kind of recognition of our the, the irrational side of ourselves again. Um, that I think if we, if we kind of accept that and we kind of uh, really take it on board, and again, as the point you made earlier, we can kind of see those cognitive failings in others much more readily than we can see them in ourselves. We all have these biases. Um, um, and I feel it, it should kind of make us a little bit more forgiving, a little bit more humble in, in our assertions, um, and, and, and a bit more tolerant, I would hope. I mean, again, this is, this is kind of going to the, to the kind of humanist side of, of my thinking, that um, I really, when again, when I first discovered the joys of scepticism, um, there's, there's almost, and again, there is still a, a, a strand of this within scepticism, maybe particularly American version of uh, a kind of militant scepticism that is quite intolerant of religious views. And again, I suppose that comes from the fact that because Christian fundamentalism is so strong over there, you have to be quite brave to stand up and say you're an atheist, whereas here, nobody bats an eyelid. You know, it's not a, it's not a big deal on this side of the Atlantic. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, my position now is that people can believe whatever they want to, as long as it does not impact negatively on others. You know, you can have the kind of wackiest ideas you like, fine, you know, I, I don't think you're right, and I'll happily debate with you why I don't think you're right, but makes you feel good, that's fine. Um, and, it, you know, a lot of the things that I would see as being kind of, from my perspective, mistaken beliefs, I wouldn't want to take those away from somebody if they found them comforting. As I said, given the proviso, they don't impact negatively on anybody else. Um, and I think that is is partly based on this conception of human beings as, I mean, again, you, you, you've said you've done a little bit of the around on it, but the idea is that we have, uh, all of us have kind of two possible modes of thought that uh, one is called system one thinking, which is more emotion driven. It's, it's, in, it's uh, very much kind of um, instinctive, is intuition, if you like. So the kind, it, it's not effortful. You're not even consciously aware of the fact that you're doing it. Um, and then in contrast to that, I mean, so the, the kind of standard examples that people give are kind of, if you, if you meet somebody for the first time and within a very short period of time, you decide whether you like them or you don't like them. Um, in contrast to that, we have this kind of system two thinking, which is much more effortful, emotionally neutral. Uh, we're consciously aware of the of using it. You know, if you have a mental problem to solve, somebody gives you a puzzle that you have to try and solve in your head, you'd be using that kind of thought. Now, I think a lot of us like to think that we've based all of our attitudes and beliefs on system two thinking, but we can show 
you know, and this, and this is, I think we can, yeah, I think I've, I've got faith in, this, in these kind of results that, that people are often much more influenced by system one, that they have no conscious awareness of uh, in terms of their, their beliefs and attitudes. Um, but system two is then very good at rationalizing whatever system one has presented it with. Um, and so, again, I think that it is just that recognition that, um, yeah, a lot of what we believe. Some of the stuff we will have good reasons for, some maybe not. And particularly, I suppose, in terms of our kind of personal interactions with those around us, uh, very often then um, it's going to be kind of very heavily driven by this system one that, that we're not even aware of the effect that it's having. Yeah, and that can be very positive, right? But also drive tribalism and bias and assumptions about people that we're not even well, it gets back to what you were saying before about the kind of um you know the the, the kind of the, the kind of us and them type mentality um that's very much a kind of system one type thing that um you know the the, the people the good people are on our side they believe what we believe and so on and so forth and that the, the, the others they're, they're those people they're the ones that cause the problems they're the ones that need to be dealt with and they're our enemies you know um and I think we, you know, we need to try, try and get beyond that. So let's land this there then with a question I often ask people, which is what helps us bridge those divides? So either as a scientist or a humanist or an atheist or a skeptic, you know, lots of listeners will, will share those views. Many of them will be um, of religious faith, of a wide variety. What have you learned, either just as a person or as a psychologist, helps us build empathy, not fall into that us and them groupish divisive thinking i think well I mean, one thing that i one point i would make is i think it's kind of important to be um as inclusive as possible um i mean i suppose particularly uh, when it comes to uh interfaith groups i think the, the kind of humanists the atheists are often kind of left outside you know i think that i think people of faith different faiths often kind of feel there is some kind of commonality between them that is just not for those people over there. Um, and I think that's the kind, I mean, I can see why why that would be, um, but it, it does kind of, it, it kind of makes, I think it's a problem. I think it's something that kind of we, we need to try and find address. And again, I know that in lots of spheres, um, humanists are involved in those kind of groups who are who are kind of working on interfaith type projects um i think that well i suppose again it's just, it's it, it's very it sounds very trite and superficial but just to be more tolerant you know just because it, again it gets back to that thing that um unless you are you know trying by force or whatever means to impose your views on me i'm not trying to impose my views on anybody uh, i i kind of you know i'm i hold my views for reasons x y and z and i'm happy to discuss that with you but if you want to believe something different that's that's okay that's up to you as long as it doesn't have negative impact on other people um and i think that I mean, one of the big problems for that kind of, you know, wishy-washy, guardian-reading, liberal view of the way things are is how do you deal with intolerance? Do you, should you tolerate intolerance? Or should is that the one thing we should be intolerant of? Um, and I don't know what the answer is there. No idea. Um, but generally, if everybody could just be a bit more tolerant of each other, that would be uh, a very good thing in my book. Professor Chris French, thank you so much for speaking to me on The Sacred. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Sacred. Remember, sharing is caring, as my four-year-old says, so please do send this or another episode to a friend, rate us on Apple Podcasts, or my personal favourite, leave us a review. I really get a thrill when I see a new one pop up. Huge thanks to Abby Allison for research and production support, and Emily Down for our visual identity. We are edited by Drew Hawley and our music is composed and arranged by Luke Stanley with vocals by Lizzie Harvey. The Sacred is a project of the think tank Theos and you can find out more about our work at theosthinktank.co.uk.